so uh, my, uh, <clears throat> my, my presentations create a certain amount of confusion, I have to admit, this go around. Uh, I, I titled this The Gospel in Three Days, and I am going to do uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of Passion Week. So here on Wednesday, I'm doing Good Friday, and tomorrow on Thursday, I'm doing Quiet Saturday, and then on Friday, I will be doing Resurrection Sunday. Everybody following here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I have to do a little, uh, you know, front end loading in this way. Um, I am I am going to focus uh, almost entirely today on Friday, uh, and that means a lot. I, I promise you, there is some good news on Friday too. Uh, but the really good news happens on Sunday. So you have to be a little bit patient. I want to make the resurrection move. I just don't want to make it today. Uh, because one, one of the problems in the church is we don't quite believe Jesus died. We think he sort of died. And it, it is crucial to the story that he died. Otherwise, the resurrection doesn't mean quite uh, the same thing. Uh, now, obviously, the day that I'm most vulnerable is uh, tomorrow when I'm doing Saturday because Scripture says virtually nothing about Saturday. Oh, but that's interesting, right? Uh, there's a day in there where all the disciples can do is wait. And it turns out waiting is going to be a crucial category for Christian faith. Because guess what you're doing right now? Yeah, you're, you're waiting. So uh, that's, that's kind of what I'm going to do uh, over these uh, three days. And I'm sure it will come as a uh, great shock to you. Uh, I actually have some visual aids today. Uh, but don't get used to it. There is nothing tomorrow uh, or, or the next day. Uh, I, I will be uh, showing you some some pictures as I go along. Uh, I'm going to take you on a journey. Uh, I'm going to lead you into uh, some passages of Scripture and uh, take with utter seriousness uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Okay, so uh, the journey. Uh, a few years ago, I decided to sit in my colleague Jeff Childers' class on the classics of Christian spirituality. Uh, Jeff is a world-class church historian and knows lots about that stuff. And I had read a great deal of the material that they were reading in that class, but I hadn't read it all. There, there were some things I hadn't read. And there's something about reading texts you've read before in community with, with young, uh, eager uh, people that sometimes makes you hear them in a different way. And as I'm sitting in this class, one of the things I'm, I'm just struck by is all of these uh, classic Christian spiritual writers have this very visceral relationship with the passion of the Christ. And now, I have a relationship with it, but mine has always seemed to be to me more intellectual uh, than visceral. And the most extreme expression of that is with uh, Francis of Assisi, when the stigmata of Jesus appeared on his hands and feet. Uh, now, I, I know that uh, you know, people tell those kind of stories about the saints all the time, and I have absolutely nothing invested today in whether you believe that story or not. I have nothing invested in that. I will merely point out that outside of Scripture, it is probably the best attested Christian miracle. A lot of evidence on this one. And, um, you know, I'm thinking, well, okay, the last thing I want is oozing sores on my hands and feet. I want a slightly less visceral relationship with the cross of Christ. But what is clear to me is they know something I don't. And I want to know what they know. And so I asked Jeff, okay, what do I, uh, 
What do I do here? How do I pursue this quest? And uh, like all good scholars, he said, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> it's a pretty personal quest, actually. Um, and so um, I, I have uh, sort of made my living uh, with words. Uh, I love words. Um, uh, I don't read the dictionary, but I like to read writers who have. Um, and uh, words have been very important to me in my relationship with the passion of Christ. Uh, theological words in some cases, but far more often the poetry of hymns. That's the kind of words that more often move me. But I thought, okay, words, 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 words. I've, I've lived so long in the world of words. Is there someplace else to go? Uh, and so I start to talk to my colleague, art professor, Dan McGregor, who starts to introduce me to art. Now, I have to do a side road here for a minute. Way back when uh, I originally went to Harding in 1976, it was possible to take these tests called CLEP test to test out of some classes. And uh, I, I come from very modest means and anything we could do to save money, so I took the CLEP test and I, I tested out of a, of a year of college. Uh, what I really did was test out of a year of my uh, education. Uh, because I, I tested out of art appreciation. And the only question about art that I remember on the CLEP test was a picture of King Kong and asking if you could identify him. <laughs> <laughs> and that gets you out of art appreciation. <laughs> and so in, in terms of my experience of, of art, I, I, I had a little. Uh, what I did know is that most of the passion art I had seen was at best kitschy uh, and at worst horrible. Uh, the Jesus who's hanging on the cross looking like he's just gone to the beauty shop, quietly presiding over the world. One of the pieces that um, uh, Dan showed me, uh, by the way, if anybody has a prayer blessing over the technology, say it now, because <laughs> my, my record with technology is very dodgy. See, oh, okay, what, 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 what do I do? Where am I, do I point the screen? Where do I point? Oh, turn it on, thanks. <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> oh, retirement can't come a moment too soon, right? Oh, okay. Um, the name of uh, this painting is Agnus Dei, which means Lamb of God. And although I'm not absolutely sure, I don't think I knew that when I saw it first. I don't think I knew the name of the painting. But from the moment I saw it, because I brought all of my Christian background to it, what I saw from the beginning was the Lamb of God. And there's something about the eyes, those sad, compassionate eyes that wouldn't let me go. So as I'm sort of meditating um, on this painting, 
uh, it leads me to Isaiah chapter 53. And again, this is where I need to make a bit of a side road to protect myself. Um, I'm now uh, going to give a brief excursus on the Greek, ro Greek word pleroo. You can't wait for this, can you? Pleroo is the Greek word that is usually translated in English, fulfilled. And so often you'll have in the New Testament uh, where the writers will say something is fulfilled. And um, when, you, when you sort of go back and look, it's clear that the passages that they're referring to in the Old Testament had a more immediate fulfillment than the one they're talking about. Everybody with me? And so then when they read those same passages from the light of faith in Jesus Christ, they not only see the old meaning, they also see the new, bigger meaning in the work of God in the world in Jesus. Everybody still with me? So, when Isaiah 53 uh, was originally written, I, I have no doubt that the writer wasn't thinking about Jesus. Uh, I'm certain the writer was thinking about some particular Israelite, or more likely Israel, generally, as the servant of God. Uh, but this just so happens to be the passage that the Ethiopian eunuch is reading in his, in his chariot. And, you know, preacher climbs up and begins with that passage and preaches Jesus. And uh, when we read Isaiah 53 from the broader picture of what God is doing in the world... Uh, it's impossible to read it without thinking about uh, Jesus. And uh, I'm not apologizing for that. Uh, I, I'm just saying to all the Old Testament scholars who want to say to me, that's not what it was originally about. I know. It's what it's about now. Well, it's, God has revealed this deeper, more profound meaning of this text. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before him, her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. And cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As I uh, read uh, that passage, uh, it sent me 
scurrying to the New Testament, uh, to see where this image of the Lamb of God is picked up over and over again. Uh, John chapter 1, verses 29 through 36, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, Acts 8, 32 that I've mentioned, here's the Ethiopian reading uh, the Isaiah passage about the Lamb of God. Um, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 20, about the, the precious uh, Lamb of God. It is uh, a theme that is continually picked up. So um, I'm, I'm thinking about this, and um, the problem is, I don't get it. I am so separated from that world. I don't get it. I get it with my head, but I don't get it viscerally. Um, I didn't grow up uh, hunting. Uh, I've never killed a mammal unless you count a mouse. And that, that was sort of a drum strike. Um, I don't get it. Blood sacrifice is not the world I grew up in. So I'm talking to another one of my colleagues about this, and uh, I'm going to put uh, this much more bluntly than he did. He's a very kind person, but this is the Harris blunt interpretation of what he said. Are you just going to talk about this? Because if you want to, you could take a step towards understanding this. He's right. And so I bought a lamb. Uh, I have a, another uh, friend who, um, he, he's kind of of that new generation of people who thinks that if you put meat on your table, you should know that something had to die for it to get there. It's not a bad idea, by the way. And so the meat he puts on the table is, is meat that he has raised and, and killed himself or, or hunted. And I tried to explain to him uh, what I wanted to do, and he understood it uh, perfectly. And so uh, I bought a lamb and put it out on his uh, property. And uh, of course, the lamb was unbearably cute. They all are. Uh, you will notice that my lamb is not a lamb without blemish. It turns out that lambs without blemish are extremely expensive. <laughs> and we're beyond my capacity. So my lamb has a cute white body and a black head, and you can't quite see it, but he's got this brown kind of fringe going down uh, the back of his head. And um, so I went out there the day that uh, my lamb arrived uh, to meet him. Uh, I did give him a name. Um, Jesus seemed too much literal. Uh, I, I couldn't go there, and so uh, I named my lamb uh, Jesse. And this is Jesse. And uh, the first time I met my lamb, um, he was extremely skittish. He wouldn't let me get anywhere uh, near him. It turns out he had a hard time making friends and wasn't very popular with the other goats and lambs. <laughs> Altogether appropriate. <laughs> and... Um, when I'm out there uh, meeting uh, Jesse, my, my, my friend Jeremy's son is out there with us. Abe is probably two years old. And uh, whenever Jesse would say, bah, Abe would say, bah. 
And I thought, okay, my lamb won't have anything to do with me, but this two-year-old is on speaking terms with <laughs> this lamb. So I go back uh, in a couple of weeks uh, to see uh, Jesse again. And uh, I pray some prayers over Jesse, and I've not uh, shared those uh, with anyone. And I'm not ready to do that today. So the third time I go out to see Jesse, I go out to kill him. And we're, I, I had talked to Jeremy before, and I said, when you, when you kill your animals out here, how do you do it? He's a deeply humane person, and he says, well, I, I shoot him. And I said, okay, I've got to get closer than that. And he said, well, there's a, there's a Middle Eastern guy out here who does halal sacrifice. I think he can tell us how to do it with a knife. Okay. So I, I, I go out to, um, to see Jesse this last time, and I'm out there for, for quite a while, uh, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, and, and finally I realize that uh, Jeremy is waiting for me to say, okay, I'm ready. Um, so I, I was. Uh, Dan, the artist, is also with me. Uh, and so the moment comes. I'm standing over uh, Jesse, and I, I promise I won't show you more than you can uh, more than you can deal with. I'll show you one more. There's me um, standing over Jesse with the knife in my hands. And I've got to cut his throat. And my worst fear at this point is that I'll bungle it. And Jeremy's got his gun ready. And I'm standing over uh, Jesse, as you see, and he's not bleeding. He's not, he's not making any sound, nor was he really trying to get away, like a lamb to the slaughter. Didn't say a word. He just lays there. But now I don't know. I don't know. And I look at Jeremy and I said, you want to guide my hand? And he looks at me and says one word. No. Nothing else. Just no. And I've not asked him what all was in that no, because I don't want to know. He's never killed a lamb this way. Maybe he's skittish about the whole thing. But I'm guessing he knows that this has to be on me. Completely on me. So I take a deep breath, hold his neck up, and cut deep from ear to ear. Blood spurts. Jesse gets up, walks two or three steps, and falls. Now I'm pretty worked up. So I go and I, I kneel by Jesse, I put my hand on him so I can feel his last breaths. And I have these things I want to say. I'm here. You're not going to die alone. 
that says meaning. We're not going to waste you. We're going to eat you. But he's glassy-eyed. He's going to die alone. I, I can't communicate with him. Abe's not here, and I don't know how to say bah. I had been out to the farm to watch my um, uh, grandparents kill chickens when I was a child. And that was pretty exciting for a, a kid. And, you know, I, I don't know. If chickens, when you kill them, you feel like you're doing them a favor. <laughs> uh, and I, I didn't know that chickens would run around after they had their heads cut off. And that's, that's pretty exciting for a boy to watch this headless chicken running around <laughs> the yard. Um, I didn't know that whatever that kinetic energy is was true in mammals too. And so as, as Jesse is laying on his side and is essentially dead, his legs are still moving. It's very disconcerting. You know, it's like he's um, trying to run away, but uh, it's too late. Um, and so he dies. And now I'm standing there um, looking at the lamb whose life I took. Uh, by the way, lambs like Jesse are bred to die. That's the reason they come into the world. I would never have been able to do it otherwise. Um, and um, I'm crying. I'm, I'm just sort of desolate at this point. And, um, I feel a hand on my back, and it's Dan. And then I feel another hand on my back, and it's Jeremy. And they say, nothing. How did I get such wise friends? Who understand there's nothing to say. But they're there. Um, uh, Dan uh, was a remarkable artist, uh, painted this picture in that moment, drew um, the knife, Jesse laying on his side with his throat cut. And what you see in the left corner is Jesse's blood. Uh, which I smeared on the canvas so I could look at it every day. At some point, uh, Jeremy disappears. And when he reappears, he has a thermos in his hand and says, you look like you could use a drink. Truer words were never spoken. <laughs> I could use a drink. And so he poured it into the top of the thermos, and I drank, and rum, burn, good. <laughs> and I pass it to Dan, and he drinks. And he gives it to Jeremy, and he drinks. All of a sudden, it feels like we're having communion around the body of a slaughtered lamb. Um, I'm not suggesting that you do that. I guess I'm suggesting that you don't. But I've 
preached thousands of sermons. I've sit, sit in, I don't know many how, any, how many hours of church. I'm guessing like millions. <laughs> or whatever the next highest denominator after that is. And I've spoke about the crucified Messiah a lot. And I was a very jaded preacher who had talked too much and felt too little. And the continual gift of Jesse to me is this. When I go to church now, it doesn't matter how bad the sermon is, and sometimes they are awful because I'm preaching it. (laughs) I had a student once say, there is no worse feeling than finishing a sermon and knowing it was bad. I said, oh, yes, there is. Much worse feeling. Being in the middle of a sermon (laughs) and knowing it's bad. And knowing there is no way out but to finish this loser. (laughs) It doesn't matter how bad the sermon is. It doesn't matter how bad the singing is is when I go to church now the mere mention of the Lamb of God or the blood of Jesus breaks my heart and I am so grateful for that because that's what it should do the relentless love of God, the lamb who volunteers to be slaughtered. Which is why last night before I preached when we were singing Worthy is the Lamb, I thought, oh, good, I'm glad there's one more song between this one and the preaching. (laughs) Start out my sermon in a puddle of tears. I'm very grateful for that. I don't get it entirely. But I get it a little more than I did. I want to show you one other piece of art because the Lamb of God image is not the only image. Of all the pictures of the crucifixion, this is uh, the one I I like the best. Uh, The artist here is a Russian uh, artist, and uh, boy, those Russian artists who do religious art, it's often stunning. Uh, His name is Nikolai Gay, G-E, for those of you who are taking notes. I think Gay is the correct pronunciation. It's simply called uh, the crucifixion. And um, one of the things uh, that I like about art is uh, art makes you work. Uh, TV and video, you don't have to work hard enough. Uh, but art, you have to sit with. Uh, you, have to, you have to look. Uh, and with all the kitschy art about Jesus, uh, this is one of those that I think comes closer to getting us to the horror of the act. Let me just point out a couple of things and try not to get in the way of your own uh, viewing of the work, but it's probably a little hard to see from where you are, but between Jesus and the, and the, the cross on the right, there is a shadowy figure moving away from, from us. Um, well, 
looks totally nonchalant. Another day on the job. Three more insurrectionists killed. I, I don't know. I don't know what he's doing, but he's going the other way. And I want to point out that the artist has depicted all three crosses as the same height. Yes. Uh, when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified like lots of other insurrectionists, and nobody was shining a light on him and making his cross higher so everybody will know he's the Lord. Yeah, that didn't happen. And uh, there is a piece that I think is probably historically incorrect about this, but um, great crucifixion art usually doesn't get too hung up on getting it just right. Uh, you, you'll notice that the nails are going uh, through the Achilles tendon uh, on, on the feet, and there's, there's just something about that image that's very disquieting. It's painful. But of course, the, the most gripping uh, part is uh, the look on Jesus' face, which is at least agony. And maybe fear. Um, it's another piece of crucifixion art that I admire very much that um, uh, good sense keeps me from showing. Uh, in, in that particular uh, picture, uh, Jesus is, is naked, and that would probably be too embarrassing for me and for you. Uh, but I just want to remind you that crucifixion was not about killing people efficiently. It was about humiliating, dehumanizing them. This wasn't the electric chair or a poison injection whose intention is to kill people as... Um, as non-violently as you can. The violence and the humiliation was the point. The Lamb of God. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon. And they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I'm the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, got a sponge, he filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened. They were terrified and exclaimed, Surely, he was the Son of God. So, I can't get this blood off my hands. I've done a lot worse things than killing Jesse. But it's the sign, it's the symbol of the guilt that on my own I cannot take away. I need a Savior. I need a Lamb of God who can take away the sins of the world. So, lest I leave you just there, <laughs> I'm having a dream. And in my dream, I'm dead. But dead isn't quite as bad as people make it out to be. My friends are sad. It's my dream. I want the friends to be sad. <laughs> and I want to have friends. But it's not so bad. I'm walking in a field. It's all pleasant enough. And I see running towards me a lamb that looks remarkably like Jesse. White body, black head, brown splotch. Uh, but Jesse has brought reinforcements. There's a lion with Jesse. But I feel no threat. And in front of the lion and the lamb, there is a little child, a little blonde-haired child, that looks remarkably like Abe. And Abe and the lion and the lamb and I meet up. And together, the little child and the lion and the lamb, and me, say with one voice, Bah! <laughs> but it doesn't come out sounding like Bah. It comes out sounding like worthy is the lamb. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.